I get it. Not knowing how to solder is keeping you from making awesome DIY projects, fixing basically any electronic device, and saving tons of money. But today, I'm going to fix that by showing you exactly how soldering works, teaching you five different soldering joints, and letting you in on a few tips and tricks you can use to level up your soldering experience. There are four things you need to have before we can start soldering. The first thing we need is a soldering iron, which you'll need to heat up before you can solder. If it's an adjustable temperature iron, like this or this, you'll want to set it to about 600 degrees Fahrenheit for solder with lead in it, and 700 degrees Fahrenheit for lead-free solder. If you don't have an adjustable temperature iron, you can take a look at the manual or the online listing to find out how hot your iron gets. Number two, the solder. The two things you want to look at when you're buying solder are whether it has lead, which changes the melting point and how safe it is. If you're using leaded solder, make sure to wash your hands after handling it, and the diameter of the solder. Narrower solder makes it easier to apply only a little bit, while wider solder allows you to move faster, especially if you're soldering bigger joints. The third thing we need is an appropriate area. You don't have to have a fancy silicon mat, but you don't want gobs of solder on your nice wooden desk. So at least cover it with a sheet of plastic. And don't solder near flammable things. 700 degree solder plus rubbing alcohol equals your house being burned down. Your area should also be well ventilated. So either buy a $300 fume extractor, go outside, or at least open some doors and windows. You'll also want a way to clean off your iron's tip, which could be a wet sponge or some brass wool. The last thing we need is something to hold the stuff we're soldering in place. I usually use this little helping hands thing, which you can get for under $10 on Amazon. But there's also a bonus item. You may have noticed your solder contains something called rosin flux, usually just a couple of percent tucked away in the middle of the solder. Solder is naturally attracted to copper when it's heated up, but if your PCB has some grime or some oxidization built up on it, the solder won't be able to flow to the nearest copper pad, as it would like to. Flux just cleans off the areas you apply it to, so the solder Solder is easier to work with, and if you have a nice new PCB, the flux inside your solder will probably be enough. But if you're working with an older PCB or you just can't get the solder to cooperate, try some flux. It'll make things a lot easier. Now that we've prepared our soldering area, let's go ahead and solder a few different joints to learn how it works. One of the things you'll find yourself doing a lot is soldering components to a PCB. Now I'm using perf board, which is just a PCB with a bunch of holes in it. They're great for practicing soldering and a resistor, which is an easy one to start with. And it's something you'll solder a lot. I'll put the resistor's legs through the board and bend them out to hold it in place. Then we can place the board into our helping hands with the part we want to solder on top. Then we can take out our soldering iron, which has already had a chance to heat up and place it touching both the pad and the resistor's lead. After a couple of seconds, I'll bring in the solder with my left hand and touch it to the pad. And because the pad and the lead are both super hot from the iron, the solder will flow around the pad and I'll pull it back after just a moment so we get that nice volcano shape. Of course, I'll go ahead and do the other leg as well, touching both the pad and the pin, letting it sit for a second, then bringing in the solder for just a moment, pull out the solder, pull out the iron, Perfect. Now that we have two good solder joints, we can trim these leads and the job is done. Now, if you're working with Arduinos, you're gonna end up soldering a lot of pin headers, which are these little strips of plastic with a bunch of metal pins in them. And even if you don't work with Arduinos, these are great practice as well. In this case, instead of using helping hands, we'll be using a breadboard. We can slide the long side of our pin header into the breadboard and then set the PCB we're soldering onto the pin header on top, making sure it's perpendicular to those pins. Just just like with the components, we'll bring in our heated iron and touch it to both the pad and the pin. Wait a couple of seconds and bring in the solder, pulling it back just in time to get that volcano shape. And now we just go down the line and solder each of these joints, hopefully getting better with each one. But some components can't be placed directly onto a PCB. So let's solder a wire to our PCB so we can extend it as far as we want. The first thing we'll want to do is prepare our wires. Clip your wire in place with your helping hands, twist the top of it to make it nice and thin, and then heat it with your iron for a couple of seconds. Then you want to bring in the solder just a little bit, 
to melt and coat the stripped part of the wire, making it stiffer and easier to solder to other things. This process is called tinning because solder is mostly tin. Once we've tinned our wire, we can go back to the PCB and slide the tinned wire through the hole which is much easier than if we had left all the strands loose. Then we can touch our iron to the pad and the wire, bring in the solder, and get a nice neat joint. But what if there isn't a hole in the PCB? I hear you frantically typing into the comments section. Well, hit the subscribe button on your way back up because I'm gonna show you that too. Again, you'll want to tin your wire, but you'll also want to tin the pad you're attaching the wire to. So touch your iron to the pad, let it heat up, bring in some solder, and cover the pad with a little puddle of solder. Now attaching the wire is as simple as placing it on top, placing the iron so it's touching the tinned wire and the tin pad, and letting the heat meld them together. Perfect. But what if your wire isn't quite long enough? Well, we can extend it. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. But what I like to do is take two untinned wires, place them in my helping hands, and overlap the stripped sections. Then I twist them together to make sure there aren't any weird strands sticking off, and bring in the soldering iron from below to heat both wires. Bring in the solder from above, and let the heat and gravity make a perfect joint. If you have heat shrink tubing, you can even slide that over, melt it, and not have to worry about short circuits. And if you want to split a wire to go to two locations, just bring in two wires from one side, one wire from the other, twist them together, iron from beneath, solder from above, and done. Now, the last thing we need to do is take these wires to their destination, a component, in this case, an LED. I like to bend the LED's legs into a U shape, and then we can take our wires, not tinned, and bend them into a U shape of their own. Then we can interlock, and wrap the strip section around as much as possible. Then we bring in the soldering iron to heat the joint, bring in the solder to join it, cut off the excess LED leg, and our component is ready to go. Now, before you go out and start soldering everything in sight, there are a few common mistakes you'll need to avoid. First, I've been very careful to tell you to touch your iron to the things you're trying to solder first and heat them up before you apply solder. That's how you get a good joint. Some people, okay, me when I first got a soldering iron, will try to add the solder to the iron like it's a glue dropper and then bring in the iron to try to smear off the solder. It doesn't work. The joint has to be heated up so the solder can bond with both of the things in the joint to get a good electrical and physical connection. Second, you need to take care of your iron's tip or it will be ruined. The iron tip oxidizes when it comes into contact with the air for a long period of time. So once you're done soldering, before you turn off your iron, take some solder and apply it around the tip of your iron to protect it from the air. Then turn it off and let it cool into a nice protective shell. This is also convenient because when you start up your iron for the next project, you can tell when it's heated up because that solder will melt. And you can wipe it off and begin your work with an undamaged tip. And speaking of soldering tips, you want to make sure to get an iron that can change tips so that it lasts for a lot longer because once your soldering tip wears out, you want to be able to just swap it out for a new one. If you don't have a project to practice soldering on, I recommend you check out this lightsaber project. It'll give you a chance to solder several different joints and you'll end up with a pretty awesome lightsaber. Go.